<laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah, freak freak. <laughs> Pardon me, I just have to exit out of YouTube now for a second. Is there some sneaky way out of the Max screen? All right, so I was also going to show you the telescope opening test flight, but we didn't have time for that. But if you just do a YouTube search for Sophia plus test flight, you'll see this, uh, they had a chaser plane follow the, the telescope for its first flight. So that's what that is all about. All right, so this is me. Um, I flew on Sophia. I'll get to that in a second. That's Sophia over on the right. But uh, just to flip a few chairs, I want to clarify that this is not a vomit comet. <laughs> so if you came to hear about someone on a plane that, you know, flew down and experienced energy, I did not do that. So go now. Oh. <laughs> um, also, I didn't get to wear, you know, any sort of spacesuit. I didn't have to go in a special bathroom or carry a special pouch or anything like that. I just wore, you know, the usual blue flight jacket. So if you came to see me in a spacesuit, you should go now because this is the equivalent of what I was wearing uh, when I was on the on the plane. Um, so it was an interesting plane in that it went really high altitude, went very, very high um, above where most planes go. But the most common question that I had from people who knew that I was flying on Sophia were, how do you go to the bathroom? What are the toilets like? Um, did you puke? <laughs> and what did you wear? So hopefully I've answered all of those questions right off of the bat. Um, we sat in normal airplane type pilot seats um, and we were in a 747. So no, no puking and no specialized bathroom. So, um, so the flight that I was on was called Sophia. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time today introducing you to the telescope, which is housed in a plane. So we'll talk both about the telescope and the plane. Um, talk about why we have an airborne telescope. It is the only airborne telescope in the world. There, there's no other design like it. Um, give you a little bit of background about infrared astronomy. It's kind of hard to explain what Sophia's advantages are without understanding a little bit of infrared. So we'll take a little digression over into um, infrared astronomy. And then kind of give you my inside scoop, my behind the scenes tour of uh, what it was like uh, while I was going through the week. So that includes kind of an overview of the week. We had some beginning training and then had some tours. So I'll show you some video footage and um, things like that and show you some, some photos that you wouldn't normally see online. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, kind of give you the, my big takeaway, you know, what, what really inspired me by my experience. So my, <clears throat> my first um, caveat is they, this was an educator's experience. I was not flying as an observer. So our, our pre-training was really just sort of about infrared astronomy or astronomy in general. We had to take a uh, master's astronomy class. And actually, my training isn't 100% complete yet. We have some additional courses or ad additional meetings to still have. So I don't know a lot of detail about each of the individual instruments because there were 24 different teacher ambassadors that were selected, and we flew in teams. So each team actually witnessed a different instrument. So they didn't teach us about all of the different instruments. Their plan now is to teach us more details about those instruments. So if you ask me a question and I kind of fog over and say, I don't really know that, I'm going to play the I flew as an educator card, not as an astronomer card. So, All right, so what is SOFIA? Uh, it is an airborne telescope. If you look at the, the mission patch, every NASA mission has a, a specialized patch. Notice this one isn't like some of the ones that you get on the missions where it actually has the name of the people who are flying because there's like 18 to 30 different people who might be flying and it changes so they don't put our names on them. Um, but it does say Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And there are two different flags that are in the actual logo. Can anyone identify? I know you can identify this one. You better on Memorial Day weekend. But what's this one? Germany, Germany yes. So it's a partnership between the U.S. and Germany. And uh, the U.S. gets about 80% of the flight time and Germany gets about 20 and They do a lot of the instrument design. So the folks that I flew with were actually many of the instrument designers, one particular instrument, in fact. Um, and so because they're the designers, they get that time. You know, basically, that's their financial contribution. I'll design this instrument. We agree to give you um, flight time. 
So it is a NASA mission. If you go to the NASA page and do a search, SOFIA comes up as one of the missions, hence it has a patch. Um, so stratospheric, let's deal with that in the name. So stratosphere is one of the layers in the atmosphere. Most planes are in the lower part of the atmosphere called the troposphere. And right in between the, um, is this little layer in here called the tropopause. Um, so 10 miles is sort of where the top of that troposphere is. And then as you get into the stratosphere, you're at, you know, 12 and a half miles is sort of as high as um, the plane would go. So I have a new patch for my, for my jacket that they're mailing to me that says that I'm in the 12.5 mile club and that's replacing my, my Sophia patch. So to translate that to feet, most commercial aircraft goes to at most 35,000 feet. Um, our, the plane was capable of going up to 45,000 feet, but we only went as high as 43.5 because there wasn't any advantage for the night that we were um, flying the missions to go any higher than that. It wasn't any clearer that higher, that much higher, and you know you just sort of be wasting fuel to to go up to that height. The the plane was capable of it. They just didn't didn't for the nights that we were there. So, all right. So the plane flies out of um, built very romantically named Building 703. Um, out of Armstrong. So you might not be familiar with Armstrong as a base in NASA, but it used to be called Dryden. So have, have you heard of Dryden before? Okay, it's out in California. Um, so actually the day that we arrived, they renamed it in honor of Neil Armstrong. So all of the signs <laughs> changed the day before we got there from Dryden to Armstrong. So brands making new, you know, welcome to Armstrong. Um, center and <clears throat> where we were. So the building that we had had, you know, brand new Armstrong sign. And uh, so half of the people who work there work at Ames. Um, they're like the science support crew. Um, and then the other half, um, or they commute between, um, work at Dryden. So some of them have quite a long commute between Northern California and Southern California. Um, it looks small in the picture. It looks like the telescope is really small, um, but it's actually two and a half meters. So for diameter, that's one, two, and a half. That's the width of the telescope. Now turn that into a circle. Um, so that's a fairly large um, circle. That's probably about the size of Arcturus over there on the wall, if you want to think about the size of a, of a two and a half meter um, or a hundred inch. Um, and it's, it, yes, it is strapped to the inside of the back of a Boeing 747. It's a very strange design. It's hard to believe I was flying in a plane where there was a hole in the back of it. Um, but the, there's a bulkhead that uh, pressurizes the front of the cabin and then everything behind that is depressurized. So I wasn't being sucked out of the plane or anything like that. Um, so the original goal was about um, 128 hour science flights per year. They've actually been averaging more hours. They've been pretty efficient in not having a lot of dead time. But I don't think they're hitting um, 120 yet. That they're, they're still kind of ramping up with some of their instruments. I mentioned already the 80-20% share with Germany. Um, and they do go to the southern hemisphere. This slide says one month per year, but that's sort of an average. So it's a long way to go to the southern hemisphere. Um, so they kind of go every you know, two years, three years. Um, and all of the science team, all of the pilots were raving about the skies in New Zealand, about how dry they were and how you know, how long the nights were. So they go down to New Zealand in the winter um, every couple of years and do these long um, flights down there. So I guess they kind of prefer that over California, but that's where they're based. So they only go down to the southern hemisphere every once in a while. All right, so the observatory is made of three critical parts. Obviously, in order to fly, you need the airplane. <laughs> um, so they bought this um, 747, this modified 747, um, from Pan Am. Actually, Pan Am sold it to United and then United sold it to NASA. Uh, so the interesting history there was, um, it was, I don't know what the name is for when you like break a bottle on the side of a ship, but christening, christening okay. <laughs> it was christened the Clipper Lindbergh by the widow of Charles Lindbergh. Um, and then it was rechristened again on one of the anniversaries of his, his, his historic flight. Um, by his grandson. So it's been twice christened the Clipper Lindbergh. Um, so they, the 747 was already modified to be one of the planes that would fly these tremendously long flights 
without having to refuel. So it would be like from California to, you know, Singapore or something like that. I mean, these like long 12, 15 hour flights. And there weren't many seats in it to begin with um, because they sort of imagined that people would ante up a lot of money to pay for a nonstop flight. And then it just turned out to be not much of a, of a demand for it. So then they wanted to sell off this, um, this modified 747. So I think they kind of got it for cheap. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. Um, so then uh, there's this, this telescope, the 2.5 meter telescope that is 17 metric tons. So it weighs a ton, a lot, multi or 17 tons. And that's actually after they have hollowed out part of it. I'll show you how they honeycombed it. That means like to carve out parts of the, the glass to make it even lighter. So even then they've tried to make it lighter. It's still 17 metric tons. Um, and then it has interchangeable science instruments. So this was a real eye-opener for, for me. I mean, the only experience that I've had um, with infrared telescopes are the ones that we put out in space. And it is what it is, unless it's Hubble and you go get it. But for the most part, when, we, when you put an instrument in space, you leave it there and you're stuck with the instrumentation that you have. So it's, it's a very modular instrument. So you, you, know, you take off the instrument, you put on something else that can detect at a slightly different wavelength. And if you need to upgrade that system, you can. So it has amazing advantages to be able to, to change how you're detecting things. And it, okay, we want to detect this today, we'll put on this instrument instead. So that was a real eye opener for, for me. I guess I had a bias, you know, that, um, that instruments in space were sort of the best of the best, <laughs> you know, like can't beat Hubble. Um, but there's a drawback to Hubble and that is that if you want to make changes to it, you got to, you know, go out into space and we don't even have a shuttle now to be able to do that. So it's, it's interesting that this has the advantage of constantly being able to, to upgrade with developing technology, which was a plus that I had never really considered. So that's what the inside of the, of the, um, plane looks like. So this 747 has a double layer. So there's a t an upstairs and a downstairs. Who's been on a plane that has an upstairs and a downstairs before? Yeah, a few of you. Not, it's not that common, right? So, so there's a little spiral staircase right here that goes to the upstairs. This would be like your super business class section. <laughs> so these are the pilots. There's actually um, five seats. They, these are sort of two empty ones that they can have guests fly in. And I was very lucky to fly in the, those seats twice. Um, and then up here are some not really lie flat, lie flat beds. They don't really have it well designed for people who want to sleep on the plane. The intention is that you're awake on the plane overnight the whole time. Um, and then there's a, a wall and lots of instrumentation behind that wall. I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. Um, and there's one bathroom up here for the, uh, for the pilots. If you come down the spiral staircase, there's another two bathrooms here. And on the, on the reverse side of it, this was like novel for everyone who was on our flight. It was the first time that they had a coffee machine. I cannot imagine all of the years that they have been flying overnight flights and they didn't have coffee machines. Like everyone was just elated that there was a coffee machine. I thought, how have you been flying overnight flights for all of these years without a coffee machine? They had also just installed the microwaves, but when they did tests on whether or not the microwaves were compatible with the instrument we were flying on, they, they saw that there was it was giving feedback to the instrument. So they said, yes, there's microwaves, but you can't use them. So, so no popcorn on our flight. Um, so then over here is where we were sitting, the educator workstation. So when they designed this, this mission, they said, we really want to have educators on board. So right from the get-go, they designed a station for educators to sit at. Um, so when you see me in a chair with a harness on, that's where I was sitting. Although really, we spent most of our time up and walking about um, but this was where our official station was. Um, right in front of us was mission control, and then right in front of that um, were the science stations, so the folks who are actually doing the research. And then right next to them is the telescope operators, and behind them are like the programmers, um, because they do some live programming on the fly to tell the, tell the instrument how to point and, and corrections and whatnot. And then there are a few kind of just open seats where you can hang out here if you want to you know, close your eyes and take a nap. But like I said, I mean, sort of you're running on adrenaline the whole time, so I didn't really sleep. I took like a one hour nap the whole time, but they are 12 hour or 11 hour overnight flights. Um, so there is some temptation to go find a bed at many points. Um, and then there's just some sort of cup, uh, cubbies over here for 
instruments. Um, behind, so looking toward the back of the plane, is this pressurized bulkhead. And behind that is the telescope. We'll kind of zoom in on that and you get a better view. So everything from this green line forward is all pressurized and every from this, everything from this green line back is open to the atmosphere. So once they open that door, um, the telescope gets very, very cold because it's, as you're high up in the atmosphere, it's very cold. Um, so they don't chill the, um, the telescope itself, they just chill the detectors and they use um, liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. I'll talk a little bit more about that too. All right, so here's the plane. You saw this already in the opening slide. Uh, we'll zoom in on it. This is one of the first test flights. You can see that there's actually these little tassels that they've, I don't know, duct taped. I don't know if it was actually duct taped, but, um, and they're actually testing to see how the airflow is over the surface of the side of the plane. So you're hearing, when you, when you check out that YouTube video I mentioned, you're hearing the pilot talking. He's like, okay, the door's opening. And, and like, they're pretty confident that they're not gonna feel anything. <laughs> but you don't really know. I can't imagine being the pilot on that plane, you know, opening a big cavity in the back of his plane, going, okay, well, I'll let you know if I feel anything. Um, but to be honest with you, I sat in the cockpit, so I know the exact moment that they pressed the button to open that door, and I didn't feel a thing. You didn't hear a thing. You could not tell that someone had just opened a giant cavity in the back of your plane. Absolutely not even a, not even a rumble or a shake in the, in the plane at all. So it's just an amazing design to be um, that stable. So they were pretty confident that it was going to work. But <coughs> All right, so this is kind of just an overhead view. We've stripped off that top layer where the pilots sit. Um, and again, there's the educator stations, mission control, telescope operator. Um, this is where you attach all of the different modular instruments that I mentioned. Um, and then here's that bulkhead and there's the, there's the telescope. So kind of another view of that. So just kind of give you a live picture of what that looks like. So these are the mission, two mission control folks for the night, um, Randy and Joanna. Um, and then these were some of the science <laughs> folks that, since they were all German, they were all like Jorgen and I, I, I'm really bad with all of their names. <laughs> Um, but that's not Jorgen. Um, I just don't remember what his name is. All right, so this is a view of the telescope, not the actual mirror, but looking toward the back of the plane. Um, so there's quite a bit of space between the last set of desks and the actual instrument. Um, and then this is the telescope operator's station. Um, some of these photographs, as you can tell, were taken at night. Um, so this is obviously during the flight. And then other ones where you see light <laughs> coming through the window are taken during the day. So we had a tour during the day where we could take out our iPhones and take all of our pictures. Um, but once we were in flight, you know, they were, they were like, you have to turn off your iPhones. We're worried about interference with the instruments. So it's a good thing I had like the good old fashioned camera because if I had been dependent upon my iPhone, I wouldn't have been able to take any photos. So, so some of these are iPhone photos and some of these are, are camera photos, but also you get a sense of just how how dark everything is. It's not as though you're, you know, you're flying at sunset. I mean, once they're, once they're collecting data, it's dark. I mean, it's completely, completely dark out there. And you look out the window, it's really tough to see stars. You'd think, oh, it'd be great observing looking through those windows, but you've got all this bright cabin behind you. So you have to like put your coat over your head to be able to look out those dark windows. Uh, this is the educator station. So this is, uh, I sat in one of these three chairs uh, for most of the time. When I told you that they stripped the telescope, they, or stripped the airplane, they really did strip the airplane. And they pretty much took out all of the seats, all of the coffee machines, <laughs> all of the water running capabilities in the, in the bathroom. So you had to use hand sanitizer. I mean, they might have overstripped it a little bit. Um, I think they might have ordered it without running water was probably not, not a wise choice. But there's also panels missing too. So you can actually see what the inside guts of walls of a plane look like. And there's wires running through here that they need access to. So they, they just leave those panels off, which is another reason why it's really cold in the plane. You'll see in the beginning photos, I'm just wearing a t-shirt. And then as the night wears on, I start putting on <laughs> more and more layers. There isn't any photos of me in my winter hat, but at one point I was wearing gloves in a winter hat. Um, so it does get pretty chilly in there. So this is the spiral staircase that I mentioned going upstairs. 
there's those, you know, couple of remaining first class seats that are on the top layer. Um, this is the cockpit right in the, in through that doorway. Um, and if you're standing, I, I said that there was sort of a wall there and there's instruments behind it. That's what the inside of the upper deck of the plane looked like. So you could just walk through there and see all these tubes and wires and they need access to them. So you can actually go look at them. Um, and this is what the inside of the cockpit looked like. So some of the instrumentation has been updated. Um, and some of it is just sort of the old 1977 original equipment. So this is where the flight engineer sits and he's got like the old fashioned, you know, sort of buttons and switches. And then there's some more digital equipment down here. So sort of a blend between the original and some upgraded uh, materials. The coffee station that you've heard me mention on many, a, many a times, um, the, the water spigot non-functioning. So no water, run, no running water. And there are the two microwaves that we could only just admire from afar. And since everyone was asking me about the toilet, I took a picture of the toilet. Standard airplane toilet, when you flush it, it's the blue liquid that goes down, nothing very exciting. And you'll notice that they taped over the sink. Um, so they just had a little bottle of hand sanitizer there. So there are no flight attendants. There's no one to help you. <laughs> There's no one to bring you food. You just get up and um, take whatever it is that you brought on the plane to eat. So everyone just goes to you know the local corner store and picks up their sandwich and their, their dinner and then their sort of midnight dinner. Um, and there's fridges on board and everyone just puts their food in there and then there's some communal chocolates that everyone shares. Um, but, I mean, before everyone was just bringing their, their coffee and thermoses, so this was, this was quite the upgrade um, to, have <laughs> to have the coffee. But, but trying to think about everything you would want to eat from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., I probably overpacked. I mean, I came on there with like a big grocery bag full of food because I didn't know, you know. It's not like you can order anything when you're up there. Um, but let me tell you, the chocolate covered espresso beans were the first thing to go. I went to go get them and they were gone. I mean, everyone was just after those chocolate covered espresso beans. All right, so a little closer look at how this um, telescope works. It's not the best of photos right now, but this is that bulkhead that I was talking, at, uh, talking about. So that picture that I took looking backwards towards the scope, this is, the, this is what's on the inside where the people are. And then there's that bulkhead and the telescope is in behind it. So I'll go on to the next picture. So here's that bulkhead right here. So you're standing on this side. Everything's pressurized over here. Here's the mirror. Okay, it's that curve. So the light comes in, hits the mirror, bounces up to a secondary mirror. And then that bounces from the secondary mirror down to a tertiary mirror, third mirror. Except for this third mirror is semi-transparent. Um, it's opaque to infrared light, so the light infrared light hits it and reflects off of it over to a detector over here. But it's such a thin layer of gold. I don't know if you've ever seen like gold leaf. If you cut it thin enough, light can actually pass through. If you think about those like gold leafed um, helmets that the astronauts would use. So the light actually can pass through, part of the, the visible light can pass through that gold leafed mirror and the visible light comes to a secondary mirror and or a second <coughs> tertiary mirror and then that goes to um, a little imager so you can actually see what the telescope is seeing in the visible even though your detector is actually capturing the infrared. So just a little animation of what that looks like. Light comes in, hits the primary mirror, bounces up to the secondary mirror, comes down to that dichroic tertiary mirror, goes off to the side. Some of it passes through, hits the visible light mirror, and comes over here. So all of the images that we saw on our screens were visible light, but yet the detector was recording infrared light. The reason you want the visible light is you want to see where am I looking, what are the objects that I'm looking at, or where am I in, you know, what sort of general region am I in, um, even if you can't actually, your eyes can't actually detect um, what the infrared object looks like. So sometimes it looks like they're pointing at nothing. <laughs> it looks like they're pointing at a dark area of sky. There is an infrared object there, an object that's giving off infrared light, but we don't see it. So, so just another depiction of the, of the telescope. So once it hits this tertiary mirror right here, it's bouncing through this through this tunnel and then all of the different instruments get attached at this end, which means this tunnel is actually still depressurized. 
um, all the way up to the science instruments. And those are the only things that are actually cooled. They need them to be like 1.5 Kelvin to 4 Kelvin. It kind of depends on uh, which instrument. For those of you who don't know Kelvin, that's really, 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 really cold. Like negative 260 degrees, new, negative 270 degrees. Really, really cold. Celsius. Don't ask me to convert that to Fahrenheit. Can someone do that to Fahrenheit? I'm Canadian. I'm really bad with Fahrenheit. Yeah. <laughs> really cold. <laughs> All right, so this is what the mirror looks like um, looking through that, that uh, side panel. I did not take this photo. They don't open the panel during the day normally. Um, but this is one of the sort of stock photos that they provided for us. So one last animation. Light comes down, hits the main mirror, bounces up to the second, goes to the third, and then comes out the side, and then comes into the area where we are, where the science instruments are. So um, these are two different um, science instruments. Uh, I've actually got four on this slide. The one that we flew with was GREAT, uh, which is a far infrared spectrometer. I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by far and near infrared. Um, but the detector inside had actually just been changed. So we were supposed to fly on uh, last Tuesday and last Thursday. Um, but the science team said, you know, we're putting in this new detector. We really don't want educators along for the first time that we are commissioning this, this new detector. We're a little nervous about it. You know, if things don't go wrong, don't go right, we're just going to like fly home. So we really don't want the educators along. So they said, okay, well, they're here for the week. The only other flight this week is Friday. So that means that the educators have to fly back to back Thursday night, Friday night. So just to give you a perspective of what that means, uh, we took off at 7 p.m. on Thursday, flew to about 5.30 the next morning on Friday, went back to our hotel rooms, slept for as long as we could, but you're completely not on that schedule, so it's really, really tricky to sleep. We all pretty much woke up at about 11. Um, some of us were lucky enough and slept to like 12 or 1. Left for Armstrong at uh, like 2. <laughs> Had the flight debrief at 4 and we're back on the plane for 6. Took off at 7, flew to the next morning at 5. <laughs> this is Friday now, overnight till Saturday. Um, went back to our hotel, slept for about 2 hours, and then got on a plane to fly from California back to New York. So needless to say, I was pretty much fried. <laughs> but, but that was the consequence of not being able to fly on Tuesday when the instrument was being commissioned. So we had to fly two back to back. They don't allow any of the science team to do two back to back, but you know, the educators are crazy enough to say, hey, let's see, I can fly only one flight or I can do two back to back. I'll take the two back to back, thank you very much. Um, so we weren't complaining too much about it, but we were pretty cranky when we got home. <laughs> anyway, so a new version of this instrument is what we flew with. I got to see what these looked like once, uh, not this one, actually not this one either, I only saw this one. Um, once it was taken off and sort of in storage in the hangar. So they have, you know, special rooms for each one of these instruments. And they actually keep them chilled. Um, because uh, they're, all, they're all being chilled, as I said, with liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. So they keep them chilled even if they're not in use because it actually takes more effort to re-cool them than it does to just keep refilling um, the, the helium and the nitrogen. So they said on this one they were filling about every three days just to keep it relatively cool. Um, so I thought that was interesting. I just assumed they'd let it, you know, come to room temperature. He said also it's really not good for the instrument to have all those big changes in temperature to go from cold to room temperature back to cold. So that's another reason why they did that. Um, so this is the telescope mirror when it was being produced. I wasn't here for these photos. <coughs> Remember I told you about honeycomb and how hollowing it out would make it lighter? So you start off with this big, um, this big piece of glass and then you kind of cut holes in it to make it lighter, but it still retains that rigidity. It still retains that structure to be able to um, silver one side of it or put aluminum on one side of it to make it reflective. Uh, so this is them lifting the mirror into um, the side of the of the airplane. So I think this one probably captures the size of the telescope better than the other pictures that I've so shown you so far because like there's a person standing there, there's a person standing there. So this is the back side of it. The front side is the is the silvered size. And there's a guy 
waiting. <laughs> Get a sense of the of the size there, and they're using a crane to lift the 17 tons. So my question here is, so how stable and balanced can this possibly be? I mean, we have this 17 ton mirror sitting in the back of an airplane, and you know what airplanes are like. They're not, you know, they're not perfectly um, stable. So the first time we hit turbulence, I looked over at the telescope, and it looked to me like the telescope was kind of bouncing around and doing this. And I said, you know, to the scientist standing next to me, wow, like, how are you possibly offsetting all of that motion? And he sort of looked at me strange and said, no, we're the ones moving. The telescope's perfectly stationary. We haven't stopped collecting any data. Um, so I have a little video clip of that. But they have designed this thing to be incredibly stable. I mean, it blows my mind incredibly stable. So you've got this pressurized bulkhead. But in that, you have these bearings, right? So that's helping to provide stability. You have gyroscopes that are responding to its motion. And then you have these like tension motors with sort of adjust to, um, to tension or, or to um, forces on the telescope as well. So the net result is when you hit turbulence, that telescope is basically motionless moving through the atmosphere. It's not wobbling at all. And the reason it looks like it's moving is because your, your airplane is moving around the telescope. So it's the airplane that's wobbling up and down, not the telescope. So hard to believe unless you've witnessed it. Um, I was sort of skeptical too, but I'll see if I can show you a video that kind of captures it. Now, when we hit larger turbulence, they weren't really a fan of me standing near the telescope taking video. So, <laughs> so this is me trying to capture what it looks like um, in mild turbulence, so it was actually more dramatic than this. You can tell I'm having a hard time. Can you see the wobbles? So it was tricky for me to hold the, the camera steady enough, but you can actually see that the telescope looks like it's wobbling, but it's not. It's the, it's the whole plane wobbling around it. Oh, oh, don't tell me it just did that. Hang on a sec. I will. Sorry about that. OK, you're my witness. I really did click the right slide. Shift F5. Shift F5 to go from that slide. Thank you. I did. I swear I did. Shift F5. Ah, I love you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. So a couple of things um, that make Sophia unique. So anytime you see IR, that's infrared. So we're thinking, oh, we've, got, we've already got Hubble out in space. What do we possibly need an airborne observatory for? Um, isn't Hubble doing everything for us? Um, so Hubble is detecting optical light, what our eyes can see and very slightly into the infrared, so what we call the near infrared. Um, so if you look at all of the spectrum of all of the light, our eyes only see a tiny, tiny little bit of all of the different wavelengths that are out there, um, between 400 and 700 nanometers. Um, so if you go slightly beyond the 700, um, we call that near infrared. And as you get further and further away from that, we call that mid infrared or far infrared. <laughs> Um, so Sophia can see further into the infrared than Hubble can, which means that it can detect objects or look through materials that Hubble can't. So you saw that opening video where I was showing you um, information about infrared light. So if you think about, you know, you, normally we can't see through smoke, but if you have an infrared camera, you can see through smoke. So just because those wavelengths pass through um, and they aren't... <coughs> Um, they aren't blocked. Um, so we can see objects that are embedded in dust clouds. So if we're looking at an area where stars are forming, um, normally we just see all of that dusty stuff, but we can't actually see the, the stars that are in behind it. Um, but the infrared telescopes will allow us to do that. Um, we can also see organic molecules um, in space that uh, something like Hubble wouldn't be able to detect. 
Um, and what's really interesting is it has mobility. So if we, if we want to go see a planet occultation, so that is, there's a star out there, we know that Pluto is going to pass in front of that star. Um, that star is going to backlight the, the atmosphere of Pluto. So if we know that that's going to happen somewhere over the Pacific Ocean, we can pick our telescope up and we can <laughs> drive over to where that place in space will be, um, which is, of course, not, not an option that you have when you have a ground-based instrument like this. Um, so it's, it's interesting to think about being able to study objects in our solar system by you know, picking up our observatory and moving it out to sea for a day um, so that we can actually see that occultation. Um, so some other instruments that, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Spitzer, but Spitzer is another um, infrared telescope, but it's actually out in space. And it's cryogen, it's cooling materials have run out because that's what happens. You build a telescope, you put a, a finite amount of cooling stuff in it to keep that instrument cool. I mean, after a while it runs out. So you can still detect some of the warmer stuff out there, but you can't detect some of um, what you need for a really, really cool instrument. So we call that a warm mission. So Sophia's um, got the ability to come land and we can refill those cryogens, uh, we can refill those cooling materials. You can't do that for an instrument out in space. Um, so it has some ability to see things more detailed. There, um, there was a flight, uh, um, a telescope that was in an airplane prior to Sophia. Um, it was called Kuiper. And someone threw out a statistic that said, the data that we collected on this last flight on Tuesday uh, was the equivalent to 700 Kuiper flights. So that's how much faster, how much the technology has improved. Um, Kuiper was flying kind of in the late 1960s, early 1970s, um, I think. Um, and then Sophia has more instruments. So again, that modular nature of being able to add more things. Um, and you can have second and third and fourth generation instruments, whereas you're not stuck with just whatever instrument was attached to your detectors when you, when you put it out into space. Um, so you have a shorter window with something like Spitzer um, because the cryogen, that cooling material, material runs out. But because you can continually refuel that, uh, they, they estimate that the lifetime window of Sophia will be something like 20 years. So a little bit of information about infrared. Remember I was telling you about um, different wavelengths that we can see. So this is what our eyes can see from like the deepest of purples um, to the deepest of reds. But we actually know that there are <coughs> other wavelengths or, or light that our eyes can't detect beyond the red, which we call infrared, and beyond the violet, which we call ultraviolet. So how we know that, or how we first detected it, was Herschel had a prism which broke light up into um, a rainbow. And he left th a thermometer sitting beyond the red. And he actually detected that the, that the temperature of, the, of that thermometer had increased. So he said, well, there must be something um, that is influencing the temperature of that thermometer. So he, he had that was his first detection, our first detection of infrared light. So that was back in 1800. So remember I was telling you about how we can actually see different things um, using an infrared camera. So this is what it would look like from an optical telescope. Uh, but if we look at the same object, Orion, uh, with uh, an infrared telescope, we can actually see that there's a lot more stuff there that our eyes aren't detecting. So there's um, a lot more information that can be had by looking at different wavelengths. That's one of the reasons why we do that. So our eyes can't detect it, but yet we can see it in this picture. How is that possible? So we have a detector that is sensitive to those wavelengths that our eyes aren't sensitive to. And then we convert it to colors that we can interpret. So we use that type of system all of the time. So we, you know, we look at, uh, we use color representation for, you know, the most expensive seats <laughs> in a baseball field. Or we do some sort of um, map of the brain and we give different colors to it. Or we say, you know, here's what the earth looks like, but we use this color for hot and this color for cold, but we don't really see that as color, right? So we use false color images to represent what our eyes aren't detecting. Um, so when you see something over here that says Spitzer infrared, your eyes would not see this. If you looked through a telescope, you wouldn't be seeing that light at all. It would just look black to you. But we've detected the infrared 
and we've used colors to represent those different wavelengths that our eyes aren't detecting. And then we combine the infrared with the optical and with the x-ray and we get a much more complete picture of what the galaxy or what the object looks like. So that's why we want multiple wavelength telescopes. So the things that Sophia is in particular, inter in particular interested in um, are galaxies and the galactic center. So one of the objects that we observed um, when we were on our mission was near the galactic center. So again, if you went to go look through a telescope, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see this object at all, but the infrared detectors were detecting it. Interstellar medium, so some of those more complex molecules that are out there, um, almost like dust, like under your bed kind of dust, but not, not quite as large, but like fluffy, loose molecules. Um, formation of stars and planets, so remember when, <coughs> when planets form, there's all this dusty ring around it and the materials collapsing and condensing, so because there's heat involved in that, we can actually detect um, uh, the, the disks of material that are rotating around those newly formed stars, and then planets in our solar system. So this is a photo again that I didn't take. Um, by the time we hit this altitude, it was dark, dark. I mean, there was just no photos for me to be had, but someone else took this on one of the other SOFIA missions. So you, so you can see the kind of the boundary um, between that tropopause uh, and troposphere and the stratosphere. Um, that I was talking about. So you're flying really, 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 really high above most of the, of the water in the atmosphere. Um, and that's really important because um, water in our atmosphere, um, or our atmosphere in general, is not very transparent to infrared. So you can see that it actually kind of blocks most of the light. So the higher you get in the atmosphere, the less water you have above you. That's why we're going so high. That is the main thing that's blocking the infrared light from our detectors. So the higher you go, the less water you have to deal with, the easier it is for you to see these objects. Um, so this is just an example of one of the, th of when I was talking about going out in, into the Pacific Ocean to go find Pluto. So that was, um, so this was, this was Pluto. Um, it's moving in front of this star and the, and the star backlights it so we can actually test to see if it has an atmosphere and, and whatnot. So that's what I was talking about when I was talking about occultation. This was the flight path. So that's that little peninsula off of California. And they flew out to the Pacific Ocean and came back. All right, so here's my behind the scenes. <laughs> um, this was one of the flights um, that we took. So this is me over here. My partner um, is another teacher in New Jersey. Her name is Missy Holzer. She teaches in Chatham High School, um, also in New Jersey. She teaches high school. Um, astronomy this year, but next year not astronomy. Um, and then these two teachers are from uh, a private school in New York. And um, she's a fourth grade teacher, and he's like an eighth grade specialist. Um, and then uh, this lady and this gentleman uh, were guests on the flight. Um, and the guy in behind right there, kind of hiding, was our escort. <laughs> um, and this is the project manager for the whole SOFIA mission. Uh, really amazing. I mean, he sat down and had dinner with us and, you know, talked about how he was not on the path to becoming a NASA scientist, like, ever. Um, and he was, you know, talking to his high school math teacher in the second last year before he was uh, due, to, um, due to go off to college. And his science teacher or his math teacher basically said, you need to take more math. And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to head down the, you know, I'm going to be like a mechanic or something. He said, no, no, you really, you really do. And he like walked him down to the guidance counselor and signed him up for three, you know, three different math classes in his final year of high school. He was pretty, you know, unhappy about it at first and then just discovered he was completely in love with that um, and, you know, went on and, you know, ended up working at NASA. So, you know, completely c attributes the fact that he ended up working at NASA to this one teacher who said, you need more math and walked him down to the guidance guidance office. So I kind of wish that I had had that in my life because no one walked me down and made me take more math. <laughs> uh, so a couple of um, behind the scenes photographs. So yes, Sophia had its very own, um, uh, what's the word for that? Safety information card. Um, at every single flight debrief that we had or, um, or pre-flight debrief that we had, they said, these are not souvenirs. You may not take them home. We count them at the end of every flight. And they would look at all of the teachers as they were 
as they were saying this. So um, it, it came to light that this is a recently printed in color version and they've been going with a black and white version for the past couple of years. <coughs> Um, and, uh, and I said, well, if you've just printed the color version, then someone must have, you know, the, this image somewhere on a computer. And they, they said, fine, we'll print one for you and mail it. So I have one of these in the mail headed to me, um, probably to arrive next week. I'm sorry, not for tonight. <laughs> um, but it would, it's a lovely souvenir. I can't wait to get it. Um, they, they also said that the, the barf bags were not souvenirs either. <laughs> there was nothing on them that said Sophia. But apparently since you couldn't take off with the safety cards, people were taking off with the barf bags too. They said, take the earplugs. Those are, those are fair game. If you want to have a souvenir, <laughs> take the earplugs. So I took a couple of earplugs, but they didn't say Sophia on them either. Um, but it does give uh, additional information for what you normally don't get when you fly on a plane. So we had what we called egress training, um, which is emergency exit training. And as I said, there's no flight attendants. So if the plane's going down or there's a fire or there's depressurization, you need to know right away. There isn't someone who's gonna stand up and say, these are the emergency exits, um, you know, go do this. So they gave us a pretty thorough training, including how to set off emergency beacons, what channels to put them to, um, how to use um, which this, which is called the um, emergency personal oxygen system. And anytime you got out of your chair, you had to take that and put it over your shoulder and walk around. Because at any moment, if there was depressurization, it wasn't like you could reach into somebody else's chair and take it, because you'd be taking theirs. <laughs> so you had to, as soon as you got out of your chair, you had to um, strap this over your shoulder. Um, and then, um, there were these emergency rations, which the guy said, eh, go ahead, open them up, try them out. Um, so we had uh, chicken, chicken bouillon. Um, there was a, a dessert bar, a chocolate chip dessert bar, which we were passing around and chowing down. I mean, it was really pretty yummy for emergency rations. And the, then the guy who was giving us the training said, you might want to slow down on that. There are a thousand calories a bar. No. So they make this really high density, high calorie food because they're emergency rations, right? You want like a nibble of it and it's supposed to really fill you up. But they're pretty yummy for emergency rations. <laughs> um, and then we said so we, um, we had radios as well as um, beacons. So they taught us how, you know, to turn on the beacons and whatnot. And then these oxygen tanks which were um, placed around the um, aircraft as well. So this is me donning the emergency uh, personal oxygen system. It is, you know, the exact opposite of what your mom always told you, which is don't put a bag over your head. Um, so there really is a tube in there that will provide oxygen for you. But I put it over my head and said, quick, take the picture before I suffocate, and then pulled it off. So it's this really tight rubber ring that goes around your neck um, to seal it off because there's pressurized oxygen that's coming through. Um, so I think it's supposed to give you six to ten minutes of oxygen, depending on how quickly you're hyperventilating in there and freaking out. Um, but um, if the plane depressurized, they said you'd have maybe a minute of consciousness before you'd, you know, you'd completely lose it. So the second there's any trouble, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to put that on because it prolongs the amount of time that you have um, and keeps you pretty rational in making um, decisions. Um, so uh, this, there was a panel um, there that got so after our EGAS training, they took us sort of on another inside of the, of the plane tour. So on the back of one of the panels, there, her, there were people who had signed, um, you know, congratulations, Sophia. So this is Bill Nye signing, saying Ast astronomical science. Um, this is Fred Hayes. He flew on Apollo. Um, this is Lieutenant Uhuru from Star Trek days. I don't know how many of you know that. Um, and these two folks, I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember their name, but I looked them up. They're both STS um, shuttle uh, folks who flew multiple shuttle. He, this, this gentleman flew on two shuttle missions, and this gentleman flew on five. And they, um, most of his were uh, Hubble resurfacing missions. Um, so Leland uh, Mc, Melvin. Mc, Melvin, thank you, and Jim Grable? Okay, well, I'd have to, it's on, it's on my Facebook page, how about that? Because I looked it up. <laughs> if you really want to know, I'll tell you later. 
Um, so another behind the scene thing that we got to do was the mirror coating facility. So this is the ring to give you a sense of the two and a half meter ring. It's sort of on an angle, so you're not really getting the full size of it. So if they take the mirror out, um, they put this support behind it, um, and it goes into this big, huge tank um, where they well, first they strip all of the um, the mirror aluminized uh, front of it with hydrochloric acid, um, and then it goes into this tank where they basically remove, um, go, you know, go down to the lowest atmospheric pressure that they can. And they have these little filaments that have, I don't know if you can see the little tiny beads that are on there. Those are like a little aluminum beads. And they have 63 or 64 of these little filaments scattered throughout this tank. Um, and they have this little window so they can see what's going on inside. More on that in a second. So they run electricity through these filaments. The aluminum heats up and it vaporizes and you get this like cloud of aluminum throughout the entire inside of the tank. And that's how they... Um, they recoat the mirror, except they've never had to recoat the mirror. It's in such good condition that all they've been doing is washing it, and so they have yet to actually need to recoat it. I said, "Wow, that's pretty amazing. What have you been using to wash it?" He said, "Horse shampoo." Come, I'll show you the bottle. It says like Orvis horse shampoo. He said, "It it works amazing. I mean, all we do is we just sort of once a year hose down our <laughs> hose down our telescope with this horse shampoo." rinse it off with distilled water and it's good to go for another year. So he said, I have no experience in telling you how this thing actually works because I've never aluminized a mirror, a mirror in it. It's just been sitting here, you know, waiting for the day that we actually need to recoat our mirror. But I guess they're keeping the horse, I mean, they must buy horse shampoo in, in, in amazing bulk quantities. It must be confusing the horse, horse folks. Um, anyways, a, a little, it's just the subtleties of their, of their thinking and, you know, how genius they were in their design. So they have these little windows, but of course, if you have a cloud of aluminum on there, it's going to stick to the glass of your mirror, right, so, or of your window, so then you won't be able to see out of it anymore. So, but you, you want this whole thing under pressure, so what they have is a little magnet up here, and you pull the magnet this way, and it opens the window, and you pull the magnet this way, and it closes the window, so you don't actually have to reach into this depressurized um, area or, or um, low atmospheric area at all. You're just moving, using this mirror to open and close the door. I thought, yeah, these people are serious geniuses. I would have, I would have, uh, you know, been been coating the inside of the mirror with aluminum, and then you'd be done. You wouldn't be able to, or the inside of the window um, with aluminum, and then you wouldn't have the use of that window anymore, which is apparently what happened to that one right there. <laughs> So another behind the scene thing, scenes thing that we got to do was to uh, walk through the hangar. Um, there was an aircraft in there that I can't mention, um, but they have repurposed the sort of spy-ish plane um, to do science missions. But they said, yeah, you can't like take a picture down in that area of the, of the hangar. But it's, it's good to know that they're repurposing uh, <laughs> spy planes for a... Sounds like the SR-71. It wasn't. <laughs> but you can keep guessing. Um, so it's hard for me to sort of give you a sense of how big this hangar was, but uh, Sophia's not the only airplane that fits in this hangar. There are uh, room for about four Sophias in this hangar, so it's a really, really huge building. Um, so I tried to get one where, like, you know, this is the doorway, but the door goes, you know, up to, like, here. Um, and there's people standing there next to this doorway, but you still, you still, it's hard to get it into the frame for you to get, to get a sense of how big um, this is. So this is a sort of typical flight plan. Um, our, this wasn't the one that we flew on, but anywhere that you see black is um, what they call a dead leg, an area where they're not taking data. And anywhere that you see blue, they're taking data. So that means that between this number four, that position, and five, they're taking data on an object called 46 LMI. Um, and between five and six, they're taking uh, data on an object called CIT6. Um, so you can see, here's sort of the California, Washington coast, um, Idaho. Don't hold me to my American geography. In case you haven't picked up, I have a Canadian accent. I don't know all of my American states. I'm the first person to confess that. Um, but anyways, you cover several states, and you have to go over different airspaces. So these little pink and yellow areas 
are um, spaces where you need to get special permission to fly over them. So one of them was Area 51 on one of our flights. They had to, like, we had to divert so that we didn't go over Area 51. Um, so this was one of the problems that they dealt with on that Tuesday flight that I wasn't able to go on. So, for example, if you're trying to point the telescope at an object, you can see that they have a very precise direction, right? So your telescope is pointing in this direction in space, or actually, it's off to the left. So you're going this way, you're pointing at an object, you're pointing at an object, but you want to be able to turn around, right? So you want another object that's over there. So you turn around, and now you're pointing at that object in your flight. But you want to be following a very specific flight path, so they know the object that they want, but they have to plan it so that they can go over certain places where they allow, um, allow planes to fly over. So one of the things that came up in the flight debrief on the Tuesday flight was this problem. <laughs> so, so the plane is coming down this way, it makes this turn, and it has to turn this way. So then it's traveling this way. All right, so this is El Paso. Um, airspace and they did not have permission to go over that area of airspace and this is the Texas border oh, sorry this is the uh, Mexican border and there's an 18 mile window so if they turn too late they end up in Mexican airspace and they'd have to zigzag to get back onto this alignment to the object so they lose science time or if they turn too early they'd end up over the area of air traffic control that was not allowing them so then again, they'd have to zigzag down this way. Um, so they said, we have an 18 mile uh, you know, window <laughs> that we have to pass through. Um, and if we turn too early, it's a problem. If we turn too late, it's a problem. So every single turn that they make is with such precision and so well timed because they want to be on a very specific heading for as long as they can because they want to be taking data on that object because that's what the, that is you know dependent upon which direction the telescope is pointing so it's really amazing you're sitting in the cockpit and you're hearing the the operators from below say one degree correction right one degree correction left so the telescope can move up and down from 20 degrees to 60 degrees but it can only move three degrees to the right three degrees to the left and it can only move itself out three degrees or back. So it has very, if you think about it being confined here, it has a lot of motion this way, but almost none this way, right? Because it's being held by that pressure bulkhead. So the way that you correct it is you change the direction of the plane. You don't change the direction of the telescope. So in some ways, they can, they can correct a lot up and down with that telescope. But that's it. That's the one axis that they can move. Um, nothing else. Everything else is dependent upon the pilots being really precise. So yes? Do you have any idea why air traffic control would care about a plane at 40,000 feet? <laughs> um, well, I, it's funny that you mentioned that because here was a situation that came up on our second flight. So um, we were at the flight debrief and they said, you know, we have a small problem with one of our, um, one of our areas that we're going through. Um, it's hot. We're like, what does that mean? They said, well, there's going to be potential rocket launches during the time that we're due um, to go over that area. I said, you know, like, I'm okay with us diverting. <laughs> but I happened to be in the cockpit while we were going over that area of airspace. And so they call air traffic control and said, you know, we had an alert that this area that we had, we, we seek permission to fly over, but we want to know if it's still hot. And if it is still hot, then we, you know, seek permission to fly over it. Um, air, air traffic control came back and said, no, it's cold. Like, so either they'd already launched or they'd scrubbed the launch or whatever it was. Um, so there's multiple reasons for why we might not be able to fly over it. Um, this is Area 51. You're never allowed to fly over it. So, <laughs> nope, you really cannot fly over Area 51. So you can see that we were on this heading and we wanted to continue um, on that, um, on, a, on a similar heading, so they plan to go north of Area 51, have a little dead, dead leg, and then continue on um, and, and take more data afterwards. So you can see that any of the black areas, there's very little downtime. I mean, this is us just getting to altitude, um, which initially isn't very high, you know, 35,000 feet, 30,000 feet, they start taking data. And they work their way up to higher and higher. I think we hit about 41,000 feet right around here. And the reason for that is it wastes a lot of fuel 
to get to that high of an altitude right away. In fact, it's really hard for the plane, almost impossible for the plane to reach that altitude right away. So they wait until they've used up some of the fuel um, before they can really get light enough to be able to get high enough. So they also plan which objects um, there are at the beginning of the data collection because those are the ones that are less dependent on having um, the least amount of uh, water in the atmosphere. You went halfway across the country. We really did. I mean, yeah. we, <laughs> this one we came within 20 miles of the Canadian um, border. Um, this one back here, we made it on, uh, what are we in? Alabama. Alabama. This one I think we're almost in Florida. I, um, I know we were in Florida airspace at one point. I don't know because it's a big, a big, big region. So, so I, I learned a lot about air traffic control in this experience as well because I'm sitting in the cockpit for some of it too. So, all right. So here are some other photos of different folks. I mentioned the science team. So these guys are all part of the German science team. Uh, that's Jürgen. I told you there was a Jürgen, and I would remember the Jürgen when I saw him. Um, these are the folks who do, who write programming on the fly. So they want the, they want to make a correction to tell the telescope to point this way or to make slight, slight corrections. So they're, they're sitting there writing the equivalent of Java, like real time. So if you're into computer programming, <laughs> you can get a job on a NASA flight doing that. Um, there's uh, mission control, and then these guys were the telescope operators. So there's me in the plane. You can tell this is a takeoff, bright sunlight in the background. Later on in the night, probably toward landing, because you can see that it's starting to look a little dusky in the background. And this guy's fast asleep at his chair. Um, and we're all wearing warm jackets by that point in time. <laughs> So what's nice about this is that you get to be able to walk around. So you can go find the optimal window for the object that you want to take a picture of outside as you're taking off and landing. So we were on our way up to Oregon, um, and they cleared us to stand up. So I'm taking pictures of mountains. Sunset from above the clouds is a pretty amazing thing to see from a cockpit. Um, and this was landing. There's Venus. And again, we're still above the clouds. So pretty awesome viewing. Um, so, a couple last slides. This is the view of the targets. Remember I was saying you have this visual camera. So it's, it's locking in on objects that we know. So these are some stars we know. These are the things we want to look at, but we don't see them. So we know because our cameras are locked in this area and we know that we're on, that this target, this target, and this target are in the box. So the box is saying, if you have these stars in that box, then you're on the object that you want. Even if you can't see it, you know you're taking data for the right area. Um, here's what I was telling you about the, the little three degree window. So if this dot moves three degrees this way or three degrees that way, or these lines move three degrees up or three degrees down, it means that we're moving out of that area where the telescope is actually pointing at the object that you want. Um, so then it would, you'd, you'd hear them come on and say one, de one degree correction. And this is our, our device for listening in on other people's conversations. So you notice I'm always wearing these headphones. It's incredibly loud. So you had different channels if you wanted to listen to you know, the science instrument team. If you happen to speak German, um, <laughs> you could listen to channel two. If you wanted to listen to the uh, air traffic control, um, communicate with the pilots in station one. And so occasionally they were listening to our conversations. We were on station six. So you'd be asking a question to the escort. And then suddenly, you know, one of the mission operators would, would come in and say, oh, Teresa, to answer your question. <laughs> and you're like, oh, someone's been listening to us. So they really did occasionally listen um, to what we were talking about. So I'm going to show you a couple of videos. Um, these, the pilots, I have to say, were just amazing individuals. I mean, I could have, I think I could have just sat in the cockpit the whole night. Um, so most of them were um, Air Force, although one was a United pilot. Um, and the majority of them, um, well, I can't say, I'd say half of them had um, flown the shuttle carriers because they were also 747s. So the 747s were um, planes that carried the shuttles on top of them. Um, so one of them had flown the shuttle into New York. Um, another one was on a TV station commenting about the shuttle being flown into New York. He said, you know, the reporter was asking him crazy questions like, 
so what is the pilot thinking now? <laughs> so it was not, not my job. I should have been flying it. So anyways, this is us coming in for um, the landing at dusk. And uh, I, I chuckled about this. This guy's name was Ace. Very Air Force kind of name, right? Um, but he had a little patch on the side of his arm and that said, size does matter. I said, I have to ask. He said, we were the largest graduating group. So we all got these little size does matter. I said, well, you're on the largest airborne um, observatory that there is, 2.5 meter telescope. It's a pretty appropriate patch. So I had to take a picture of it. Um, so let me give you a couple of videos. I know I'm running a little bit over. Am I doing OK, Jim? Should I just continue to go a couple of videos? Or? OK. <laughs> So this is the cockpit. You can hear how loud it is. So this is where the flight engineer sits. You can see some of the paneling, some of the older panels, and then you see some of the more digital displays down below. And the only reason that you can hear them is because they have the little microphones and you've got your headphones on. So it's, it's a really overwhelming buzz for the whole night. You really do want to be wearing um, those earphones. And uh, both of the gentlemen that were pilots, the pilot and the co-pilot, had also flown those shuttle carriers that, that I had talked about. Um, so this is us coming in for a landing. I told you that I had an opportunity to sit in the cockpit during takeoff and landing. Here, the plane is talking to you to tell you how close you are to the ground. So the pilots could actually turn on the runway lights because there's no one monitoring this runway. It's not an airport that anyone else uses. <laughs> I lost it a little bit there on the bump. <laughs> and we're down. You can see the lights on the pavement of the runway. Uh, okay. And then just to kind of give you a quick sense of, I mean, we, I'd like to say it was really exciting inside visually, but, um, you know, things move pretty slowly. I mean, this is the course of about 20 minutes of exposure. So one exposure every uh, one minute. So some of these are pointing corrections. So that so the plane is changing direction slightly. So we're repointing. Um, so this isn't really turbulence. Those were um, pointing corrections for the most part. Um, but again, people are just really sitting at their computer terminals or chatting with each other. Most of the science team standing up front, they're all kind of chatting with each other. Um, but everyone else is pretty much sitting at their station. So visually, there's, it's not that exciting to see what we did. <laughs> we stood around and talked a lot. Um, but the telescope was really interesting to watch it um, make all of these little small corrections. And then one of the coolest things that we got to do was on that Tuesday flight uh, where we didn't get to fly, we knew exactly where the plane was going to be taking over. So we parked our car and set our cameras. So we got to be underneath Sophia as it was taking off. So um, just to warn you, I'm standing on the edge of a minivan holding this video camera. And at some point, it gets overhead. And I've got to turn around. And I kind of fall off the car. So you're going to get a little <laughs> motion sickness <laughs> in a moment. Do you have a video of you doing that? No, no. They were all focused on the plane, thankfully. So I'm doing great. I've turned around and then I fall. <laughs> you can already starting to see that it's banking a little bit and uh, then they turn. Most of the most of the flights sort of turn immediately north um, after after taking off. So I think those were all of the videos that I had. Let me go back to, all right, what was the trick? Shift F5? Yeah. See, I actually remembered it. That's a miracle. All right, just a couple last photos, and then I'll take some questions. 
So this is um, after we've landed, we have to wait for a tow. <laughs> so we're, we're, you know, taxiing for a long period of time. I have to tell you that I was so tired at that point that I'd fall asleep and I'd wake up and take a picture and then fall asleep again. <laughs> so there weren't very many pictures of this. Um, so uh, attempting to look bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as we're um, as we're taxiing in, but again, uh, peeling off layers um, as things warm up. So, in summary, um, you know my big takeaways from this experience um, because we didn't really get to spend a lot of time looking at the actual data. Um, the scientists were, you know, hesitant to really show us everything that they were discovering. Um, understandably so. I mean, so the data is considered proprietary. You, you can't actually have access to it for a year. Um, so they would, you know, talk in more general. Like, we're, we're looking at a starburst galaxy. We're looking at a galaxy where the stars are forming at a much faster rate, um, and we're trying to figure out why, you know, those sorts of conversations, which was about the speed I was comfortable with after, you know, staying awake for six hours anyways. But my big takeaway is that just the teamwork is incredible. I mean, this is just a ballet of engineers and scientists and pilots and I mean I don't know my experience with telescopes up to this point is like someone has built the telescope and the engineer has walked away and has left it in the hands of the scientists to use and the scientists might go back to the engineer and say hey you know can you re can you design something new for me but this is far more intimate you know like there were engineers on the flight with the scientists for that first flight when they commissioned it because they said, you know, if something went wrong, I was the person who knew how to do this and he was the person who knew how to do that. So there were 18 people from this German team who all had like a tiny little piece of the puzzle and they all flew because they didn't know for sure if it was going to work on that first flight. You know, they said, we were pretty sure, um, you know, sort of in that German sort of way, we were, we were pretty sure, but we weren't really sure. And then we were just so happy when it worked. <laughs> um, and I said, so, you know, is, is the data as, as good as you imagined? Oh, it's, it's better than we imagined. I mean, they were just so happy that everything worked because you didn't really know until you got the instrument up there um, if it was going to work as planned. So, I mean, there were particle physicists on this flight because they had a hand in designing the instrument that was detecting. Um, uh, this infrared light. So it, it was just an amazing dance, an amazing ballet of pilots, you know, flying with amazing precision and a telescope that was designed to be so balanced that you could fly through turbulence and not lose a second of data and just really cleverly designed, right? You're flying through atmosphere that's changing. So they're, they're looking at an area of sky that's not their object and going back and forth really, really quickly so they can subtract out that background. That's, and then they also look in another area of sky to see how consistent the sky is so that they can also adjust for that as well. So just the most amazing design that can be constantly changed um, as technology improves. And it's, it sort of fit that mental mission that I, that mental image that I had of a NASA mission, you know, where you have, you know, I, I picture Apollo where everyone's sort of sitting at their desks. And, and that wasn't dissimilar to our debriefs, where uh, our mission debrief. Um, where you know, everyone sort of had their role and they say, so how is the instrument and how is this piece and how is this piece? And every person kind of gave their report for you know, everything good to go. Um, so it really was that image that I had of everyone playing their, playing their piece. And, and the big goal is that the flight goes as smoothly as possible to collect the maximum amount of data for the most amount of time and the least amount of downtime. And everyone has their contributing piece to make sure um, that that happens. So you've got the mission directors, the pilots, the scientists, everyone is working together to make sure that, that they accomplish that goal, the maximum amount of observing time. So thank you for coming. If you, <laughs> if you want any more um, information, you can go to the SOFIA webpage, or if you just do a Google search for SOFIA Observatory, don't do SOFIA, because you'll get SOFIA the princess that my daughter watches, and she was a little confused when I told her I was flying on Sophia. Um, <laughs> or you can email me, and there will also be a YouTube video um, of tonight that Jim will make available, and I don't know quite what the YouTube video link will be, but he will have that for you shortly. But I could take questions if anyone wants to ask. Just don't ask me about the toilet. I really, really, or the coffee machine. Anyway? 
Still, I know. I went on for long. Yes? You mentioned that you could see organic matter, organic molecules. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, so an example of one is polycyclic aromatic hy hydrocarbons, um, and they are part of the interstellar medium. They're part of the material that sort of lives out in space um, that can collapse to form uh, baby stars or can be between us and a region where baby stars are forming. So, um, so it's just one of the things that um, can be detected by infrared um, telescopes that you can't detect uh, with other uh, with other telescopes. So it helps us understand what's out there in space. You know, when you think about space, you think of it as being empty, but it's actually a pretty dusty, complex, chemically place um, if you look in the right spots. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where I was telling you about it kind of going back and forth, it's called chopping. So it's taking a quick picture of the object that they want and then looking at the sky nearby so they can subtract out that background. And so they're doing a lot of quick images that they stack together rather than one long image, which is also one of the reasons why they can do this photography on a moving aircraft because you're not taking like a 30 minute exposure and, and getting all of that wobble in there, right? You're just going back and forth. The end result is that you stack all of those together to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of my job? Oh, well, my job isn't this. You know that, right? <laughs> um, so this, or what was my favorite part of this? I would say just meeting all of the different people that were involved. I mean, everyone was just so passionate about their job and so convinced that their job was the most important job. <laughs> so, you know, the pilot would say, if I don't fly this right, the scientists don't get the data, you know, and the scientists would say, well, if I don't plan the objects, you know, in, in the right order, then the pilots can't fly it. So, so everyone thought that, you know, their job was the most important, but everyone was so, you know, opening us as educators with open arms to, to come, you know, come sit at my station, you know, come talk to me, let me tell you about what I'm doing. Um, you know, come sit in the cockpit, you know, let me tell you, you, you know, about all of the different things that I'm doing. I mean, everyone was just so open and welcoming and no one was standoffish in any way. So I was, that was probably my favorite part, just realizing all of the different intimate roles, you know, that work together as a team. You had a question too. Yeah. Do they just look at like stars and Kind of things that they look at. So, not so much planets, but like the disks um, that planets would form from would probably be a more likely um, object that they're that they're looking for, um, or the beginnings of areas where stars and planets would form. Um, I know that they actually looked on the Tuesday mission. They looked at planets in our own solar system. I know they looked at Mars. Um, but I'm not familiar uh, with all of the different missions that they've had and all of the different objects, but from the ones that I was there witnessing, starburst galaxies, um, you know, protoplanet, protoplanetary regions, um, parts of um, the galactic center, but I wasn't familiar with any, any particular like extrasolar planets that they, big dusty things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but like I said, they didn't, um, they didn't treat us like we were scientists coming to understand the scientific mission. It was a much more like come experience this as an educator kind of mission. So I didn't really have intimate details about all of the objects and what they were studying. It was much more global. Okay. So you mentioned <coughs> this nice mobility so they can kind of go to where an occultation might occur. Yeah. Do they ever use that to their advantage and kind of move back and get they may. I don't know about it. I mean, we, they just had presented us with the case study of Pluto as one of the occultations that they've done. I don't know of other occultations that they've done. That was the only one that they mentioned. Um, certainly, they would have the capability to loop around, but I, it, it's a pretty defined flight plan. Um, 
The only time that they deviated a little bit on the second night was when we got much closer to the moon. I mean, the moon was in the wide field imager and they were like, wow, we might need to deviate from our plan a little bit. And it was like one degree or something. I mean, there was very, very small deviations. But if they wanted more data, they would just write it into another future mission because they're trying to pace it all out so that all of the legs work together. That would be a lot of waste of time to, to loop. Ah, oh, one of the reasons they have educators flying is because we're going to be advocates, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, Sophia's been cut from, um, from uh, budgets in Congress more than once. So just recently, they basically said, you know, you're zeroed out, close down the mission. Um, and then they, uh, so they have an $85 million budget. And they just recently got told, well, okay, well, you know, uh, Congress has approved 70 million dollars so that's still a 15 million dollar shortage just for the American part uh, component so they're hoping that the Senate will bump them up to the the, the 85 million that they're looking for um, otherwise they're gonna have to do some major major cuts so and the Germans aren't too happy about that because they said you have an agreement <laughs> that you have to give us one year notice if you're gonna shut this down and Congress keeps doing things like that's it Close it down, you know, and the Germans keep saying, you can't do this. <laughs> um, so they're hoping that um, things will pick up budget wise. So, so it's on a, I have a question. You know, when you fill out your income tax each other year, they have, they have like checkpoints you can put a dollar for you know, this or that or whatever. How come NASA does not have a box where you can put, give them $10 at the end of the year? I wish they did. Um, I, I think, you know, people overestimate how much of our tax dollars are really going to NASA. It's a really, really incredibly small fraction of our tax dollars. Yeah, I actually just spent a couple days down in D.C. advocating for this type of thing. And the good news is for this year is it's actually slightly bumped up, ever so slightly, but it's still roughly one half of one percent of the overall. Industry. Thank you. That was the number that I was searching for in the coffers yeah, of the back of my mind. Half a penny, yeah, out of every dollar. Yeah. So if you're feeling passionate about saving Sophia, you could write to your uh, senator. No, your congressman, because it's past the Senate. So say, save Sophia. <laughs> Restore it to its original funding. <laughs> yeah, not, not Sophia the princess. So. I'd be happy to know that our congressman does support NASA heavily. That's good to know. All right, so anyone else? All right, thank you, everyone. All right.